is this stone cursed? This is the cursing stone in Carlisle's Millennium Centre. Yeah, I know this is a channel called Scotland Unplugged and Carlisle is very definitely south of the border, but bear with me. The story starts a bit further north. Welcome to Scotland Unplugged and a tale of cattle raiding, curses and a superstition that just won't go away. Carlisle is not that far away from Edinburgh and it gives me an excuse to take the A701 early. No one I know calls this the A701 though, we all call it the Devil's Beef Tub Road. That's a cool name for another one of my favourite stretches of tarmac. The actual beef tub sits in what was the Western March. It's thought that it's called the Devil's Beef Tub because of the border reavers. Reaving, as you'll know if you watch my video about Rob Roy, is an old English, old Scots word for raiding. And in this case, along the Scotland-England border, families like the Johnstons, the Moffats and the Armstrongs were known for raiding around and across that border and coming back with whatever they could lay their hands on. They came from both sides and they raided on both sides. They were a law unto themselves. And between the late 13th and early 17th century, they carried on pretty much as they liked, ignoring the crown and even the church. One theory says that this place is called the Devil's Beef Tub because of the Johnstons, who used it to store their plundered cattle. The hills around it form a 500 feet deep hole, which would do the job quite nicely. Walter Scott had quite a lot to say about the place. In the Red Gauntlet, he wrote, it looks as if four hills were laying their heads together to shut out daylight from the dark hollow space between them. A damned deep black blackguard looking abyss of a hole it is. That's pretty unambiguous. The reavers lived and reaved in a time of turbulence between Scotland and England. First of all with the wars of independence and later with the back and forth between the houses of Stuart and Tudor. But the borders were pretty far away from central Scotland and in the pre-car days a good bit further away from London. And with all the invasions and counter invasions and rampaging armies going either way, the people living in these lands were frequently the ones left paying the price. You can see why they might want to take matters into their own hands and get a bit raidy. It wasn't even considered criminal. But much like in the Highlands in the time of Rob Roy McGregor, it was a way of life. One story goes that a well-known reaver's wife realised her larder was completely empty and so at the dinner table that night she served him his spurs on a plate. The message was clear, saddle up and get to work. The land around the borders is hilly, formed by continents gently colliding 400 million years ago. It's not suited to growing crops at all, but it is good for livestock. And a few cows are a bit easier to lift than a field of barley. The governments on both sides kind of tolerated the reavers. They might not have been very loyal to either crown, but they did effectively act as a last line of defence. Queen Elizabeth I was so impressed when she met one of them, the bold Buccleuch, she supposedly said that with 10,000 such men, her brother in Scotland could shake any throne in Europe. But she was more impressed than some. The church, in particular, had a bit of a problem with their lack of respect, not to mention their habit of corrupting churchmen in the area. So much so that in 1525, Gavin Dunbar, the Archbishop of Glasgow, had had enough. He'd been born in Mockram, in Galloway, to the west of the border, and he'd been prior of Whithorn, which meant he'd have been well aware of the reavers and their activities. In an attempt to put an end to their reaving ways, he excommunicated them and issued a curse to be read from every pulpit in the area. That meant everyone hearing it would know not to associate with them. He cursed their heads and all the hairs of their heads. He cursed their faces, their brains, their mouths, their noses, their tongues, their teeth, their foreheads, their shoulders, their breasts, their hearts, their stomachs, their backs, their wombs, their arms, their legs, their hands, their feet, and every part of their body from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, before and behind, within and without. And that's just the beginning. The curse ran to over a thousand words and even included their horses. 
Say what you really mean, Gav. I'm not reading it out properly because although I'm not superstitious, some people, especially descendants of the Reavers, are. In reality, at the time, a lot of people in the area might not have taken it too seriously when they heard it. I mean, it was a bit like the Wild West round here, and people were probably more scared of the Reavers than they were of any archbishop in Glasgow. In the end, what did stop reaving was the threat of execution or transportation issued by James VI. James was King of Scotland and eventually in 1603 he became King of England as well, but he viewed his new kingdoms as one country. In fact, he wanted to make it one country and all this reaving really wasn't helping his case much. He was embarrassed when he heard that his Scottish subjects had stolen 1,280 cattle and 3,840 sheep and goats. The areas of the borders had previously been divided into marches, overseen by wardens, in an effort to bring some kind of order, if not any kind of law. James renamed them as Middle Shires. There'd be no mention of any border. It was one country. Or else. It's worth a try. Fast forward nearly 400 years to 2001 and Carlisle City Council commissioned a local artist, Gordon Young, to design an art installation for their Millennium Gallery. It included the names of all the Reaving families and this, the Cursing Stone, containing 383 words of the Archbishop's curse. In 2001, the area suffered an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. Then. There were floods. Carlisle United even got relegated and people started to blame the stone. The Bishop of Carlisle invited the Archbishop of Glasgow to go down and bless the stone. A local councillor demanded they destroy it. They actually considered the matter but as you can see it's still here. It's probably worth mentioning that the artist Gordon Young is descended from a reaving family and that the stone itself contains a blessing to counter the curse. I'm not a big believer in curses. I'm a big believer in confirmation bias, something that makes you feel as though you're unlucky. It may as well mean that you are unlucky. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments. See you next time.